Today, I welcome Dr. Isaac Barzile, who is a Toronto-based uh, prosthodontist, and he's the principal of a large prosthodontic practice in Toronto called Prosthodontic Associates. Isaac, what are you going to talk to us about today? Well, John, I'm going to talk about single implants and single implant occlusion. It's something that I deal with all the time, and it's something that I'm called on to correct many times. I just think it's a, it's a topic that most people need to hear about. And, and why is it such a hot topic in your mind? Well, you know, implant dentistry is such a big thing now in, in the specialty as well as in the general practice, and everyone seems to be doing it. And many of us do it really well. And it's great when we first place our restorations, but we have to understand that these restorations need maintenance, and maintenance is a big deal. And somehow that maintenance education and that maintenance effect seems to drop and we don't pay as much attention to it as we should. And then we run into problems. So I get called on to fix some of these problems and I just think, you know what, maybe we should just talk about it. I believe you've got a slideshow in which you're going to walk us through um, some of the issues and, um, and, and how to fix them. I believe so and I, I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so John, I want to present here uh, my thoughts on implant occlusion. And these are, I'm, I'm starting off with this picture here just because this is a great picture that shows the difference between implants and natural teeth. What it shows is, in fact, it shows how a natural tooth is connected to bone by a ligament, whereas an implant is connected to bone by way of a bone connection. And really, when it comes to the difference between the two, this is the main difference. And I actually show this particular picture to my patients because I want them to understand that implants and teeth are in fact different. And the occlusion on implants and teeth are in fact different. And it is because of this different connection that a tooth is allowed to move slightly and an implant is not. So a tooth itself is is able to move approximately 100 microns uh, in a vertical direction or in a horizontal direction when the periodontium is, in fact, healthy. If your periodontium is not healthy, in fact, that tooth moves more. The implant, however, does not move. It is firmly fixed in bone. If anything, the bone can compress a little bit, maybe in the order of 10 microns, but for all intents and purposes, that amount of compression is negligible. But if you have a lot of movement and a lot of compression, that's surely going to um, damage the bone over time. Well, if you have a lot of movement in teeth, it damages bone. And if you have a movement with an implant, uh, in fact, that implant has not fused to the bone. It's not integrated. And in fact, it's a failure. So we want implants to be completely fixed in bone. That's what we're looking for. And because of that fixation, when it comes to occlusion in the mouth, we have to make sure that the occlusion on an implant takes into account this differential movement. So an implant crown, in fact, needs to be out of occlusion by at least 100 microns in a healthy dentition. And it should only come into occlusion at the very end of a full clenching cycle. Then, in that way, in fact, we are allowing the teeth to compress completely before that implant comes into function. Right. If you don't do that, that implant is, in fact, in hyper-occlusion and will take more load than it should, and then you run into all kinds of problems. The problems include screw loosenings. The problems include fracture of implant uh, crown structure. The problems can also include fracture of the screws holding the implant crowns in place and the, fr and the problem of, in fact, implant body fracture can also happen due to occlusion. Right. And the, these problems are very real and in my practice I deal with these problems all the time because I feel that most dentists just don't pay enough attention to occlusion, especially at the recall visits. And that's really why I want to talk about this. So if I move on to this particular clinical scenario, this patient came to see me many, many years ago. And the first molar 
is in fact a regular size implant. It's a regular platform implant, if I can use that terminology. And what that means is this access hole that I'm circling now with my pointer, uh, that's where the screw goes in to hold this individual crown. Yeah. But yet, if you look at where the occlusion has been placed on this crown, the occlusion has been placed quite a distance away from the central part of the implant. This occlusion that's distal to the central part of the implant is in fact acting as a cantilever. And as you function on this, you're going to twist this implant restoration. It's going to start to bend. So the proper way to deal with this is in fact not to have occlusion on this. And it's in fact to, I'm sorry about that. It's in fact to have uh, an area where the, the crown itself doesn't come into occlusion until all the other teeth are compressed in their sockets. Now measuring 100 microns is really difficult. How do we do that? Uh, we've tried to come up with all kinds of ways, but at the end of the day, what I do is I make sure that my implant crown is in fact out of occlusion. It still functions, you can still use it to chew, but if you try to bite a piece of thread with it, it's just not going to work. Right. So in this particular situation, this patient came to see me because this first molar was loose. And the treatment for this was to tighten up the, the, the crown and adjust the occlusion. But I asked her, I said, what happened with this tooth right behind it, which is in fact another implant. And that secondary implant is in fact a wide platform implant. It's a bigger implant. It's got a bigger seat. And she said, well, you know, I've got a single crown on that as well. And if you notice the occlusion on the second molar, the occlusion is much closer to that access hole. That did not come loose because the forces are being supported directly by the implant, uh, by the implant head. Yes. So I said to her, I said, didn't your dentist suggest that maybe you should connect these implants to each other? And she said, you know, my dentist did suggest that but I didn't want to. And I said, why not? And she said, because I wanted to floss in between the implant crowns. I said, well, are you flossing between the implant crowns? And she said, no. So I said, well, you know, if you had connected these two crowns to each other, what would have happened is you would have had this large distance from the front of the anterior implant all the way to the back of the posterior implant and everything in between is in fact a non-cantilever zone. With it being a non-cantilever zone, you can put occlusion there and you don't have to worry about the 100 micron thing. Yeah. She said, well, my dentist sort of said that to me and he said that in order to do that, I'd have to pay some extra lab fees. And I said, that's good. That's what I think you should do. I suggest you go back to your dentist and deal with that because otherwise, eventually, this will come loose again and this will break. And then this patient disappeared for a while. She came back 12 years later. And when she came back, I took this x-ray and she said, you know that crown that you, uh, that you tightened up for me many, many years ago? And I said, hold on, let me look in your mouth. And I looked in her mouth and go, yeah, yeah, I remember this. She says, well, it came loose again. I said, did you ever go back to your dentist and have these things connected like I told you to? She said, no. I said, well, why not? She said, because he still wanted to bill me. I said, well, you know, you should have paid for it. And she goes, what do you, what do you mean? And I said, well, the way your crown feels right now, I hear a clicking. That clicking usually means there's a metal to metal fracture someplace. Yes. If I look really carefully at your bone, especially down here, yes. I see there's a little bit of bone loss. Yes. And I turned to her and I said, I think you've broken your implant. And as when I unscrewed it, again, here's another film. Here's a picture of the occlusion now. When I unscrewed it, crown came off and so did the head of the implant. So what she's got now is a, an implant in the bone, lots of bone around it, 
but she has no head to the implants. Had these things been connected to each other, this would have been a much stronger situation and this would not have happened. Right. So we're now faced with a situation of dealing with this and I turned to this patient and I said, you know, many years ago, this would have cost you $800 to fix. This is now gonna cost you about $8,000 to fix. And of course, we fixed it. And the way we fixed, the way we fixed this was in fact, we made a splinted bridge connected the back to the front, and we had to devise some, some type of post structure that would make use of the existing implant that was still inside the bone. We secured that to the existing implant, not just by screwing it in, but also by cementing it. And then we connect the, the, the superstructure, the bridge structure to that with the screw. This structure now, although it is inherently weaker because I don't have a head on top of the implant. This structure now will support occlusion in between the two implants. Did you give any consideration to removing and replacing the, um, the implant in the position of the six? Well, there, there's no question that we could have done that. But I felt that this implant, because it had only fractured up at the very top, I felt what was left could still be used. That can't be done in all implant systems. It really is dependent on the depth of the of the hole inside the implant, whether I can connect something. Okay. So on some implants, I can do this. On some, I can't. Okay. But in this situation, we were able to. This has worked well for the patient, but it really made me think about the concept of splinting implants. A single implant needs to have no occlusion. If there are implants next to each other, you connect them, you can place then normal occlusion on those two implants or three or four. And in fact, here at the office, if implants are next to each other, they are not made as individual units. They are all connected to each other with normal occlusion and that's how we maintain these patients. And is that advice you give to general dentists when they're considering um, doing implant um, um, supported restorations that are side by side? That is the advice I give to everybody. That is what I teach in my courses. That is what I teach my staff when we do our recall visits. We always check occlusion on the single implants and the multiple implants, but on the singles, we are always adjusting occlusion when we find the occlusion changes. Yeah. You have to understand that if we have no occlusion on a single unit, the other teeth are eventually going to migrate, drift, erupt, and we need to make some adjustments. Right. So our restorations that we make have enough porcelain so that we can actually adjust that porcelain, polish it, and the patient continues on with the same restoration. And what do you advise the patient to use to keep that area clean and just like you know, underneath the, if you like, the splint? Well, in general, we suggest uh, using a water pick or some kind of irrigation device. Uh, we also have uh, super floss and different forms of floss threaders that you can get through these areas. It's generally not a problem to keep things clean. Okay. And uh, so we, we don't really have that as an issue. And when the patient says they want to be able to floss, chances are they're not going to do it anyways. You know, you can ask them if they flossed before. They probably didn't anyway. Right. And is there any particular regimen for recall and maintenance for, for this type of implant over and above um, or others? Well, this kind of implant, we would recall the same way we always do. Uh, we recall our patients at six months, and uh, if nothing has happened in six months, uh, over three recall sessions, we'll go to 12 months. Right. As soon as we adjust occlusion, we go back to the six-month time period, and we do a few recalls at six months. Okay. So we want to make sure that these things are stable. And it's interesting, when we adjust these teeth, Patients will usually say, you know, my teeth fit together a lot better now than they did when I first came in. Right. And they don't realize they had a problem to begin with, but as soon as you adjust the implant occlusion, all the other teeth are allowed to come back into occlusion and they can actually um, be functioned on, they can intrude into their sockets, they have total freedom of movement. Whereas if the implant is a little bit high, and you don't notice it, but if it's a little bit high, uh, that stops the other teeth from coming into occlusion. Um, I know it's impossible to tell 100 microns, but what do you do? What, what instrumentation do you use to, to get that occlusal reduction as close to right as possible? 
it's really difficult. We've tried stacking uh, shim stock on top of each other to get 100 microns of shim stock space, but that's really tough. So what we actually do is uh, we start off with the crown in occlusion according to the lab, and then we adjust it when we, when we position it. And we do it so that when the patient squeezes their teeth really hard together, we're able to pull one piece of shim stock through. So, in fact, we probably have 114 microns, and that's about as close as we can get. <laughs> Sounds pretty accurate to me, Isaac. <laughs> um, and I believe uh, you're going to come back at, at a later stage to show us some other interesting cases about um, what can happen if, um, if implant occlusion isn't exactly right. Yes, we will. I, I will come back. I will talk about broken screws, how to get broken screws out of implants. I will talk about how to get loose screws out of implants, and that's the logical next step. So we will do that at another visit. I want to thank you very much for, for this presentation, and I look forward to welcoming you back and welcome uh, viewers uh, to, um, to send us in any interesting questions or other cases that they have. Um, for, for our consideration uh, as well. Bye for now, Isaac, and thanks. All right. Take care, John. Bye-bye.